Greetings to all of you, my dear sisters and brothers and my dear friends, a warm Lenten blessing for all of you from your Pastor Yeti. Again today, two episodes on reliving the Passion. So today we're going to read from Mark 15, verses 29 to 31, and from the second one, Mark 15, the verses 33 to 34. And those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you would destroy the temple and build it in three days? Save yourself and come down from the cross. So also the chief priest mocked him to one another with the scribes saying, He saved others. He cannot even save himself. Let the Christ, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Those who were crucified with him also revealed him. Is it nothing to you, all you that pass by? Behold and see if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. No. There never was such sorrow as this. And the fools who pass by jeering merrily reveal an iniquitous ignorance, passers by indeed, untouched, absolutely insensitive. Here are the unbelievers of the world. The chief priests, on the other hand, are those who should know better, having learned the word of God, but who seek herein nothing other than the proofs of their own power. Therefore, they see only so much sorrow as they think they have themselves imposed. And they are like all ecclesiastics seeking authority, satisfied by the crucifixion. Those crucified with him know no more than the priest. Why should they? And finding him but a little diversion on their way to death and perdition. The sorrow of the Messiah is nothing to these, so they mock. But we, who in steadfast faith do hear this cry, what sort of sorrow do we see? How painful is this mockery? Well, if he is innocent, the mockery wounds him with terrible wounds since he can wrap himself in the dignity and self-pity of a misunderstood goodness. If he is innocent, the crucifixion makes him a better man after all since a sacrifice is the very extremity of selfless love. But if he is guilty, the mockery is accurate and right, and his wounds are an intolerable anguish. Guilty? 
Is this thinkable that Jesus is guilty? No, it is not thinkable. It is as unthinkable as the pain such guilt must cause. But it is true. There are moments right now when Jesus looks down on the sick derision of the people at his feet and he agrees. That is right. I am worse than false priests and outright criminals. We can phantom the grief of the Holy One of God when he must say in his soul, I deserve this. Yet that exactly is a sorrow before us now. Maybe none shall see with more terrible clarity the sorrow of our Lord than the Apostle Paul. For our sake, he writes, God made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. He does not write to bear our guilt as though a good man became better by substituting himself for our punishment. Severely, Paul writes, God made him to be sin. Jesus has become a bad man, the worst man of all man, the badness, in fact, of all men and all women together. Paul does not write to bear our sin, as though Jesus and sin are essentially separated things, the one a weight upon the other for a while. No but to be sin. Jesus is sin. Jesus is the thing itself. Today, Friday, between the third hour and the ninth, beneath a blackening sky Jesus has become the rebellion of humankind against his God he is therefore rightly crucified he bows before his deserving there is nothing to ease his sorrow no not even some sweet eternal sense of innocence however mistaking the motives of his enemies. Jesus belongs on the cross because sin deserves, sin requires. The complete judicial damnation of the deity. And yet, and yet, the same Jesus is also the Holy One of God. Now as much as ever before, because now he is completely obedient to the Father, <clears throat> holy, he must hate sin with an unyielding hatred. Behold then, and see a sorrow unlike any other sorrow in the universe, and right now Jesus hates himself with an unyielding hatred. He is in our own eyes vile. He cannot console himself with the goodness of his crucifix or the wickedness of his detractors. 
passers-by, priests, criminals, because they are right. The wicked one are right. This is perhaps the second bitterest swallow in the cup of suffering which he drinks, and the worst is yet to come. This Christ? Is it from such anguished self-knowledge as this that you have saved me? The deep knowing of my own sinfulness, a knowing from the vintage of the judge, my unrighteousness, God, in most, in God's most righteous eyes, self-loading for eternity, hell. Therefore, yes, because in you I have become the righteousness of God. Yes, amen. Mark 15, 33 to 34. <clears throat> And when the sixth hour had come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at that ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Noon. The sun at its zenith is hidden. That great black prowling range of cloud from the west has killed the sunlight, closed the sky, swallowed the earth in a yellow darkness. The wind is still. The city stops breathing. Animals grow so Restive they rear against their traces, rolling their eyes. Owners about through the darkness the names of the beasts. Parents stand in stone doorways and cry out for their children. Miriam, Yeshi, Yeshi. There descends from heaven a long, low muttering. Another. The commanders of the elements are taking counsel together. Suddenly, lightning. The crack shatters the dark. Blinding light is splitting sound as the cedar twists and screams and breaks from its trunk and tumbles down. And the boom of that thunder batters the houses of Jerusalem. Cheshi, Yeshua, come, come home now, now. And it shall come to pass in that day, said the Lord God, that I will cause the sun to go down and moon at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day, and I will make it as the morning for an only sun and the end thereof as a bitter day. Boom! The rain dots the dust with big drops. Boom! Now it falls hard and straight and heavy. Boom! The wind screams down and hurls raindrops like pellets flat out at the faces of running human beings, stinging flesh. The black between the lightning is the darkness Egypt knew, thick darkness, even a darkness which may be felt. Yeshua, Yeshua, where are you? This is a pure, bloody panicking, but the weeping child cannot be hurt. The weeping parents weep in vain. Boom! No human mockery can match the voice of the storm 
for mortal scorn. Lightning flashes. The hill outside the city is wet with wide wet and empty. Silhouettes stutter and black out. Three crosses. The guards, some women at a distance. Those who laugh at the internal, at the central figure this morning are gone. No one is laughing now. Thus the first hour of the afternoon, and the second, and the third. The few who stood the storm are still on the hill at the end of three hours. The night hour of the day, lightning has fled, the thunder has exhausted itself. The blackness persists, and suddenly a voice worse than thunder, because it is a human voice. A horrified wailing arises. Eloi, Eloi, my God, my God, who is that? The one in the center? The one in the perfect center of element darkness, the focus of this storm, him? Eloi, Lama Sabachthani, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, him. He hangs in an abyss, that one, him. My God, why have you forsaken me? And who answers him? The thunder is silent. The city holds its breath. The heavens are shut. The dark is rejection. The silence is worse than death. No one answers him. No, not even God. Not even God, his Father. Because he who has become hateful in his own eyes now is hateful likewise to God, his Father. Jesus, him. It is against him that heaven has been shut. In this terrible moment of storm, the loss of light for humanity is at once the loss of love and life for its Christ. He has entered the absolute void between the Father and the Son. Now exists a gulf of impassable within and substance. It is a divorce of despising. For, though the Son still loves the Father obediently and completely, the Father despises the Son completely because He sees in Him the sum of human disobedience, the sum of it from the beginning of time to the end of the time. He hates the Son even unto damning Him. This is a mystery, that Christ can be the obedient, the glorious love of God, and the full measure of our disobedience, both at once. But right now, this mystery is also a fact, and the fact must seem to last forever. Hell's horror is that it lasts forever. And this precisely is the bitterest drop in the cup. That crying down eternity, unheard, separated absolutely from God. From the God he cannot help, but love even still Jesus is in hell. The darkness that covers Jerusalem from noon to the middle of the afternoon. It is no less than the damnation of the Messiah 
who wails and gnashes his teeth in an utter solitude from now, so it must seem unto eternity. Hell is eternal, and he has descended into hell. But your iniquities have separated you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you, that he will not hear. No, my sins. But you, my Savior, were my sins before the Father. Then this too, is what you have saved me from, the cold rejection of the living God, a wandering solitude forever and ever. Hell is colder than the promise of its is hot. Hell is zero in the bone of the universe. You saved me from damnation. Thank you, Jesus. My beautiful people, this is not a drama that is lifting up a drama and again another drama to get the attention of upsetting your emotions <clears throat> in the wrong way. This is life offered by our Lord Jesus Christ to us. Because he drank the cup and did the will of the Father to save the world. For those in the Lenten journey Jesus offers his life for you, his love. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ because he did it. He said it is finished. He finished the job. It's okay when you're doubting. If your faith is weak, it's fine. But tell him, if you're going on a journey that is not an easy one, tell him. And you could say, well, he hears everything, he knows everything. Well, that's, he is relationship. He wants to be your friend. He wants to be your God. Completely. Not 50%. And he wants to embrace you with his unconditional love, compassion, and healing. He offers you a restored life. May the Almighty God bless you in your day. And remember what he did. Offer him back the person who you are. Because you cannot come another way than the person you are. 
you see through masks. You can hide from others, but not for God. You can fool others, but you cannot fool God. Glorify Him in everything you do, and let Him bless you and the ones close to your heart and your brothers and sisters. And pray for those who are outside, those who maybe hate God. And I'm not saying that rude, but some people don't like God. They don't want to hear about Jesus. And we cannot change that, but we can change it to offer them the love of God. And allowing the Holy Spirit to be transformed, to become more like Christ. And that's the only thing we can do. And if you do that, you offer life to them. And it's still on their terms to make the decision. God offered this Christ to give you a second chance. He offers you a new life. Warm Lenten blessings, my beautiful people, to all of you. From your pastor Yeti. Bye.